Hey, welcome everybody. There's something I want to share with you today. This week on the 30th of April would have been the 65th birthday of my pastor, Filippo Chula. He passed away uh, on the 17th of August in 2018, and he was my pastor since I came to church when I was 19 years old. Pastor Chula had a tremendous impact on my life, a huge impact that I still feel today. And I thought as a, as a way to bring him honor and as a way to keep his legacy alive, I wanted to share with you 10 things that I have learned from Pastor Chula. Number one, the first thing that comes to my mind and probably the most important thing that I learned from him, and it was his vocabulary every single time almost that I spoke to him. And it was the importance of order. Pastor Chula would emphasize so much on order and what he meant with order was actually what we call right now ministerial ethics. Pastor Chula is very adamant about it, very strong about it, and had very deep, strong convictions about it. He wanted us, ministers, young ministers, preachers, whoever you were, he wanted you to obey the chain of command. He wanted you to not jump over him, but he always wanted to be kept in the loop. He wanted to be aware of what was going on. Um, he he wanted you just to respect the chain of command if you had an idea don't just implement the idea but you pass it through him because he wanted to give his approval he always told me he said brother Yeroon I will never say no to your ideas unless you don't ask me and so it's something that I've learned and it's something that I still apply today as a pastor I'm very thankful for that lesson. He was a kind of pastor that did not like any surprises. He didn't want to have any surprises during the worship service. He always told me, I don't like surprises. It didn't mean things had to be predictable, but he wanted to know what was going on, who was doing what, who was doing where, where they were going, what they were doing. He liked things to be done orderly, amen, and that is scriptural. He wanted things to be done with a certain level of ethics. He wanted to be aware of what was going on. And if you were given a certain responsibility, don't, don't just go ahead and do whatever you think is good, but run your ideas and run your, the things that you want to do, your plans. We always had to run them by Pastor Chula. And it's something that I've learned, something that I still apply in my ministry today. And I'm very thankful for that lesson order in the church order in our walk with god is extremely important the second thing i learned in ministry is in ministry you must go slow one time uh, pastor chula and i were sitting at the dinner table and he told me he looked at me and he said brother Yeroon, i want you to go slow with your calling and I said, what do you mean you want me to go slow? Because I was all excited and I wanted to preach and, and win the world to Jesus Christ. I wanted to travel. I wanted to evangelize. I wanted to do everything. I wanted to quit school. <clears throat> I wanted to do everything for the call of God. And Pastor Chula said, I want you to go slow. I asked him, what do you mean with going slow? He said, you know a turtle? I said, yeah, I, I know a turtle. I want you to go slower than a turtle. I want you to go slow. I'll make you go slow. That's what he said. And um, when, when he told me that in that time, uh, it frustrated me because I did not want it to go slow. But in hindsight, I understand the power and the blessings of going slow in ministry. You, he said, you have been called by God. That's wonderful. You want to preach? That's wonderful. You want to be used of God behind the pulpit? Great don't go too fast don't preach right away he wouldn't allow you to preach right away you submit you obey you follow his leading and if you were called to preach as I, as I was I I was not allowed to preach right away I had to sit down I had to sing I had to do all kind of things except preaching because he wanted me not to rush into my calling but he wanted me to go slow because he wanted me to he wanted to test my character he, he wanted to see if I could obey, if I, would, if I could really submit. He wanted to test my motives. Why did I want to preach? In, in essence, he wanted to keep me humble. And God used my pastor to put humility in me. 
And so today, if you, if you want to rush things, please be reminded of what my pastor told me. Go slow in ministry. Deep roots grow slow. They grow deep, but they grow slow. Amen. Big trees, thick trees grow slow. But the slower it goes, the deeper the roots go and the stronger the tree will be. Something that he always taught me and I thank him for that. So important. Don't rush into your calling because you will get burned. Go slow with the Lord and follow the leading of your pastor. Third uh, thing that he taught me, it's very important, was loyalty to your pastor and to the local church. Um, he would use that word a lot. He said, Brother Yudun, I like people that are loyal to the church, loyal to me, loyal to the local church. He was loyal to his leaders. He spoke very highly of his leaders. He, he honored his leaders. And so he put that, that sense of loyalty in me. And he would test that loyalty in many different ways. But I believe that as leaders, if you're called to preach, you got to be loyal to your pastor and loyal to your local church. Amen. You got to be a faithful servant of the Lord. If you if you say that you're going to do something, you had to do it. If you say you were not going to do something, you were supposed to not doing it. He, he, de he demanded almost that loyalty and that faithfulness. And he put that in me. It's something that I don't think I'll ever forget. And it's so important that we're loyal to our pastor, loyal to our church. Fourth thing, a uh, principle that he put in my heart that I was not aware of, that I didn't understand until I came to church, was the importance of holiness. Uh, he was the first one that would teach me holiness both uh, holiness on the inside my character my attitude my response to certain situations uh, my uh, my just my behavior in general my speech he would he would talk to me about that and he would show the example but he would also teach me about outward holiness how that we should be dressed how that a, a man should be dressed and present himself when he goes to church when he's out in the world when he's with his family and he also taught me the importance of modesty with women his wife gave a tremendous example of that of just the simplicity and the beauty of modesty and holiness and it's a, a conviction that God I used Pastor Chula for it to put in my heart and in the heart of my wife and now we put it in the hearts of our children and we try to put it in the hearts and the minds of the people that come to our church. It's that love, that conviction for modesty and holiness both on the inside and in our outward appearance. I thank him for that. The fifth thing that I've learned from him is a very specific lesson that one time he taught me in the hallway of our church. There was a person that um, left church and taught Pastor Chula and said, I'm going to leave church. And I would see his reaction when that person would tell Pastor Chula and said, I'm not coming back anymore. And he was very peaceful about it. He blessed the person. He, the person walked away. And I went to him and I said, Pastor, why aren't you fighting for these sheep? I mean, the devil is trying to take them away. Why aren't you... you arguing or trying to convince them to stay or pray with them he looked me in the eye and he taught me a lesson that as a pastor um, right now I have understood and I have felt the weight of this principle and the truth of it and he literally told me he said brother Yeroon for some people God will tell you to fight for other people God will tell you to let them go I did not understood what he was talking about. I thought you should fight for everybody, for every person that tries to walk away. I, I thought every person would walk out of the church. I thought it was a trap of the enemy or they were just being carnal and that we would somehow convince them <clears throat> with enough Holy Ghost and with enough con conviction and persuasion. But I find out after, um, after seven years of pastoring, it's not the case. And I find out today that the words of Pastor Chula are very true. There's some people uh, that you just have to let go. God will give you a peace in your heart. It, it's painful whenever somebody decides to leave church for whatever reason it is. But sometimes God will give you peace about it. And with, in my case, just as Pastor Chula told me, God put peace in my heart and literally told me, don't fight for them. Let them go. You won't win the battle.
But there's other people, there's other situations where God has put it in my heart even before they decided to go that God said, be careful. They're going to walk out. They're going to make decisions that are not pleasing to me. They're being deceived. Expose their deception and bring him back. And so I would go to them even before they decide to leave. And I would start talking about the possibility of being deceived. And the truth would come to the surface. And truth be found that they did want to leave church. And they've been thinking about it and wrestling with it. And right there in those moments where, where we converse with them, we can, in fact, impact their decision. And we can bring them back to the Lord and remove that deception from their minds because for some people you'll have to fight because God does not want them uh, to walk out and Pastor Chula knew that and he taught me that in just two minutes right there in the hallway for some people you fight for others God will tell you to let them go the sixth principle or the sixth thing that I've learned from Pastor Chula was, and, and if anybody knows him that is watching this video, revival was his life. If you would go eat with him, if you would go to the lunch garden, if you would go to McDonald's with him, if you would sit in his house, if you would sit in his office, if you would sit in his car, if you would walk with him, the only, he, he, he does not talk about, he, today he would probably not even talk about the coronavirus. He would just say, man, we need to have church and we got to have Bible studies and we got to win people to the Lord. The only thing he talked about was church, the people of the church and how that God would grow the church. It was the only thing. Sports, he didn't care about sports, at least not to me. He didn't care about television. He didn't have a television. He, it was just the word of God and revival and church. It was his life. And I remember a week before he died, as I went to Dallas and stood beside him on his deathbed, um, he told me, he said, I can't wait for my legs to start moving again because I want to walk the streets of Brussels and I want to evangelize and I want to preach this gospel. And he had tubes in his nose and tubes in his mouth and tubes all over his body and nurses would come in and out. And he had, was very uncomfortable with all of that. Him knowing the kind of person that he is, it made him very uncomfortable. But throughout that pain and, and that, that state of, of discomfort, the only thing he really talked about was he said, don't look at me, don't, this is nothing. This, we need to preach the gospel. Go home and preach the gospel. It's what he told me. It was, it was his only vocabulary, revival. And that's why I talk about revival today with our church and with our leaders because it's the only thing I heard from my pastor and it's the only thing that I want to speak. It's the kingdom of God and to serve in his kingdom. Seventh thing that I've learned with him goes together with um, the last thing I said is to walk with God. If you would ask Pastor Chula, how much do you pray every day? He would not say, I pray one hour every day or I spend two hours in prayer every day. He would say, I pray every day, all day long, from morning till evening. Before I thought, that's easy to say. But now I understand what he was saying. He walked with God. Pastor Chula literally was so, um, he was so not distracted by the things of this world. He was untangled from anything of this world. He lived in the presence of God from morning till evening. It's the only thing he did, him together with his wife. He walked with the Lord. He prayed all day long. Just him in his mind and his spirit conversing with God, and letting God speak to him and him to God. And that's where I learned. It's not really about setting a time on your watch to pray one hour every day and feel that you've done the religious duty, but it's morning till midnight, walking with the Lord. Such an important lesson. Number eight, the eighth thing that I've learned from my pastor uh, is something that I still struggle with and I try to do is Pastor Chula trained the leaders and then he sent them out. Many of our church, all of our churches have started because of the ministry of Pastor Chula. He trained them and then he sent them out, which left a great void in the church. Uh, to be honest, less tithes, less people coming, 
less spiritual power. All these people, those preachers that come to your church, he said at one time when God, fe when he fell it from the Lord, he said, go, you got to go. You got to start a church. You got to go to this city. You got to go to that city. You got to do this. You got to do that. He would send them out. And today I'm training leaders. Um, we are training leaders. But when the day comes that I need to send some of them out, it's going to be heavy on my heart because I know the impact that it will have on our church, my emotions, but I also know the impact that it will have on the kingdom of God. Pastor Chula set the right example in that. Train them, but don't keep them. Send them out. Amen. Number nine, this is a, a very important lesson I learned from him, and it was funny sometimes, but Pastor Chula was not afraid to say no. As a pastor, he showed me the example and he showed me the importance of saying no. I know many pastors, I know many leaders right now who are afraid to say no. They say yes, but they actually mean no. Or they say no in such a way that people understand it's a yes. Pastor Chula was not like that. If he did not want it, he would write you an email. He would call you on the phone almost two seconds after he is aware of something that he didn't like and he would tell you, I don't want this. This is not what I want. It's not going to happen. I say, no, I'm very sorry. I'm the pastor. This is, what it's, I, this is what's best for you, but it's not going to happen. He did that so many times in, in, in our time together, so many times and every time. Uh, I accepted it and he was probably right. He, he could say no in such a way that you understand, okay, this is a no, I won't ask again. And so leaders, if you're watching this, pastors, if you're watching this, no will not offend your people. And if it does, they'll get over it. But no sometimes is unnecessary. And we got to learn to be able to say no in a clear, gentle, but clear way. It's a no. I love you, but it's no. And if people get offended, they'll get over it. But at least you will not reap bad consequences of saying yes when you wanted to say no. And that's something I learned from Pastor Chula. He was a great no-sayer. Amen. Last lesson that I've learned from him, uh, tremendously important, uh, is that every pastor needs a pastor. When I was preaching, after preaching, he came to me, looked me in the eyes and said, great job, you preached awesome and powerful, but stay humble. Listen to your pastor. Obey me and follow me, and you'll do greater things than I've ever done. He would tell pastors that they had to submit to him because he was their bishop. He would show that example. For him, that was important. And today, as my pastor passed away in 2018, I found myself without any pastor. I was a pastor, still am a pastor, but I had nobody that would speak into my life. I had nobody that would say no to me. I had nobody that would say, I don't like this, or, or this is good what you're doing. I had no voice of encouragement, no voice of direction. And so I went to look for those voices in my life, and I found them. And uh, those of you that are now my pastor in my life, you know who you are. I need a pastor in my life. Some, uh, one of them calls me almost every single week. Uh, just see how I'm doing, checking up on me and my family, how the church is doing, what I'm doing in this crisis, how I see this when this is done, how I'm going to open the doors again. Um, and I'm thankful for that voice in my life. Another pastor, of course, is, is Brother Tuttle. He is my pastor. He's also the overseer, the president of the UPC of Belgium. But he's my pastor. And Brother Tuttle knows how to say no. And Brother Tuttle knows how to give direction in my life. And I need it. And I'm thankful to God for that. Every pastor needs a pastor. You need a pastor. You need somebody that is able and that you are willing to let you speak into your life and, and, and you're open to them when they can say no to you or say, I think this should change or I think you're doing awesome. Go forward with that idea. Press forward. Make that decision. We need those voices in our lives. There's too many independent lone wolves 
out there that just start churches and they have no sense of accountability to anybody, only to God. My accountability is to God and to none else. Fortunately, I don't believe that is scriptural. I don't believe that is healthy. And so Pastor Chula, put that value, that truth in my spirit. You need somebody that can speak into your life. Because if you're all by yourself, you think you can do it all, which is a dangerous mindset. Amen. And so today I'm thankful for the pastors in my life, and the voices that give me direction. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned something from these 10 things that I've learned from Pastor Chula. I want to give honor to him this week, a tremendous missionary to Belgium, a tremendous pastor, great friend to, uh, to me and my family. And I honor him today.